All right, guys, welcome to uh, building an app with WordPress's REST API. I'm just gonna reset this timer and hopefully my slides will work. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Greg, I work for the Boston Globe. Um, I've been doing WordPress development for, I would say, too many years. Uh, and I started picking up React last year. Uh, I did the Boston Globe's elections app, which was all in React. Um, Boston.com is in WordPress, which is one of the things that we work on. Um, and we also have a couple of things at the Globe in React. Um, so in my free time, I also like to make incredibly dumb apps for my own amusement. And today, hopefully, I'm going to get to show you pieces of one uh, that is in progress. Um, let's see. So I also love stupid GIFs. Um, check me out. It's not about me. Uh, just disclaimer about this talk. It's open source. Uh, you can go to GitHub and view the source or just view the presentation. So the first two links are just for the GitHub repo. Uh, there's a readme with like lots of useful links. And the bottom one is like if you actually want to see this presentation on a web page and uh, follow along at home. Excuse me? Yeah. It says work in dash p 17 no dash. That's a good point. Thank you. No dash. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I did my best to link to resources that will help you on your on your little React and WordPress journey, so check them out. Um, all right, so let's do a quick audience participation. Um, I know everybody's probably at very different skill levels. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with REST as a concept? Just raise your hands. Everybody, all right, this is going to be awesome. Uh, Jason, anybody use Jason? It's like most of the internet. Yeah, great. <laughs> Uh, ES6, anyone use the ES6? Fewer, but almost everybody, okay. React. All right, how many people have used the WordPress JSON API before? Almost everybody. How many of you guys like cats? <laughs> All right, what about dogs? Dogs are winning, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so you guys probably know almost as much about this as me. Um, that is great. Hopefully I don't make too many mistakes. Uh, so the first question you might be asking yourself is why? Why would you want to bolt one of these things onto the other in a potentially dangerous and awkward way? Um, well, so WordPress is a really fantastic platform for managing content. Like we all know that, that's why we're all here. Um, it does a few things like extremely well. Uh, managing content first and foremost. Uh, when we switched Boston.com to WordPress, our editorial team saw like a huge boost in productivity and overall happiness with their workflow. Uh, it's really great for just like non-technical people to go in, create content, publish it, no fuss, no muss. Um, custom fields, whether you use like advanced custom fields or field manager or just use the like plain WordPress ones are like a big helpful way to create kind of content buckets for your editors or for your content creators. Just taxonomies, just being able to tag and categorize things. Um, and then also just dealing with authentication and security, like just having a basic user model uh, right out of the box is really huge. WordPress isn't the most secure platform in the world, but we all benefit from the huge community of people who work on it and the frequent updates and support. So we get all that stuff kind of for free, which makes WordPress pretty appealing, as you guys know. But it doesn't really provide a lot of help for front end development. Like, as somebody who's done development for a long time, or a while, I would say. Uh, it leaves me wanting like a few things. Uh, there's not a lot of conventions when it comes to JavaScript development in WordPress. Uh, you're kind of left to your own devices there. Developing a WordPress theme can be kind of tedious sometimes, especially if you're doing it over and over again. It could feel like you're just creating custom fields all day. Um, sometimes you get into like writing a jumble of just plugins and theme functions that interact with each other in weird ways and kind of create a chaotic architecture. Uh, there's a lot of really good theme frameworks that you guys probably know about, like Sage and Timber and others. Uh, but those are really kind of end runs around WordPress's limitations in that department. And if you're kind of going through all the effort to code all this stuff either from scratch or using these advanced frameworks, why not choose your own tools? Why not you know, just use something better? Um, that's kind of the argument I'm making. So there's a few cases that I can think of where using the WordPress REST API would be really useful as just a back end and then building your own front end on top of it. Uh, so it would be really good if you need to create a rich interactive experience. Um, 
you know, WordPress is really good at like content driven things like obviously blogging, you're going to be reading something, the content is in front of you, you know, but it doesn't really handle like things where users are like clicking around and interacting and maybe there's state changes. Um, so if your website is action oriented and stateful, uh, you know, like if it was some kind of, you know, system with inputs and outputs, like you had a ticketing system for events or you know, booking yoga classes or even just like a game, um, you probably want to use some kind of front-end framework. Um, if you want to release your app on multiple platforms, uh, something that's really appealing about React is that there is React Native, um, which allows you to, without too much more work, just deploy a mobile app based on your existing code base. Um, and then the other, the other use case is kind of a hybrid. Most of your website is just a basic blog or website, except, um, like I said uh, before, if you needed like, you know, I've had clients who have been like music venues and they need a uh, ticket reservation system. Most of their website is just like normal WordPress blog, but they need some kind of advanced thing where people need to do, you know, buy tickets, reserve tickets. Um, and that kind of thing. And there's always like a huge conversation, like how do we cram this into that? Um, so by creating like a front end app on top of WordPress using the API, you can kind of hybridize those in a clean and effective way. Um, so let's take a look at some examples. <clears throat> uh, the first example and probably the biggest example uh, of the WordPress API in action is WordPress.com. Uh, so WordPress.com uses Calypso to um, basically just do all of their content management. So it's all like a nice front endy app uh, that just makes post requests to the API and get requests. Um, something that's also really interesting is uh, the New York Times uses the API to power their live coverage blog. So when they have breaking news and they're doing live updates, the New York Times isn't exclusively on WordPress, but they have they have a small blog power thing that just feeds live, live updates, like say about Sean Spicer resigning or whatever's going on uh, that day. Uh, they use Backbone and React, and uh, later in the talk, under the resources, I've actually linked to a really good talk that they gave about how to do that. Um, and then since I know we have a lot of higher ed people, this is, hopefully this loads, <laughs> this is a front end app uh, that I built on top of WordPress a couple years ago, and it's a college map and it's still pretty content driven. I'm gonna to try to like click around. Yeah, so you, you know, you basically have normal kind of run of the mill content about buildings on campus and stuff, but it's done in such a way that it's more than just a blog or more than just like a directory. You have lots of interactions. You can kind of filter and browse through these buildings and stuff like that. At the time that I built this, uh, the WordPress API wasn't as mature and I didn't know too much about React. So this is all just kind of bespoke JavaScript um, and CSS and HTML, but you can kind of get a sense for some of the interactive things that you can do um, when you have you know, a larger WordPress ecosystem, but a part of your site needs to just you know, be its own thing. Um, all right, so let me just try to get back here. All right, so there's so I want to talk for a minute about the different architectural approaches you can take in terms of just how to get React into your WordPress. Um, option one, you can integrate your app directly into a theme, uh, meaning like you have your React app folder just straight up in, into a theme. Uh, the big pro of that is you can take advantage of all of WordPress's theme features, uh, whichever ones you want to or not to use. Um, taking advantage of plugins and all that. Uh, it's really good for, like I said, hybridizing standard content-driven pages with more interactive experiences, like that map I just showed you. Um, but it's not really super good for large, complex apps. Like, if you have a whole system that you're trying to design, you're gonna run up against problems where you're not really sure what is going to be responsible for what. You know, does WordPress do this? Does React do this? Does you know your front end framework do this? You know, say you wanted to have a newsletter sign up through Mailchimp. Does do you do that with JavaScript? Do you do that with WordPress? Do you use a plugin? It can be hard to make those kind of calls, and it's really easy to make kind of inconsistent calls. Um, so also, I'm noticing a bug. 
So this, this line of text actually goes on the previous slide. I did make a small theme that will help you if you wanted to do that. It's just like an index.php file, and it tells you to run create React app. Uh, so you can try it out. It's really low barrier to entry. Um, but the second option is just create a standalone app. Uh, so what you'll do is you'll just have your own app environment. Um, you know, it can run on Webpack or whatever you want. Uh, and then it just makes requests to another WordPress environment where it just grabs the data and there's no, it's loosely coupled and there's no real in integration. Uh, some of the advantages of that are you can take advantage of something called isomorphic rendering, which means that you can use Webpack or your web server of choice to basically um, serve content on the back end on the first page load, which is super snappy and fast. And then for future loads, you can load through Ajax uh, with request to the API. And we did this on elections um, where we were updating the content every 15 seconds with live results. Um, you can host your app anywhere, like I mentioned. You get a lot of the benefits of being able to use something like Webpack. Um, <clears throat> you know, you can also swap out either part of your app. You can swap out either the JavaScript or the CMS entirely for a new platform. Relatively no problem because the concerns are separated. Um, and developers can also work on the API and the app in parallel. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that. Uh, the only con is that you'll pro you might come across some potential cross-origin and authentication problems. Luckily, there's a lot of resources out there about how to do authentication with uh, the WordPress REST API. Uh, I'm not going to cover that so much right now, but um, it's super important. And if you have an API out there, uh, just know that it's unlocked by default. Um, and you probably want to throw some, uh, throw some authentication in there. All right, so now let's talk about the REST API. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to go through a few simple examples. Um, so I, I hinted at there being a stupid app that I was building, and uh, I'm basically going to use it as like a concept to discuss some of these other, uh, these other features. Um, so basically what this app is is me and a friend of mine have been curating stupid videos on the internet through WordPress uh, for years now. Uh, we have like a database of like over 2,000 videos with varying levels of entertainment value. Um, and basically what this app does is it just like pulls a random one and shows it to you and then it, when you're done it just shows you the next. There's like very little navigation or selection um, and it's kind of like an anti-Netflix. Um, so it's called Breed TV, so you'll maybe see that around in URLs and stuff like that. Uh, but the first thing I want to talk about is just the basic URL structure of the, the WordPress API. And I know a lot of you have touched on this before, um, so sorry if this is a little repetitive. So the first parameter is WP JSON, which just means like this is the API. Um, and then uh, there's a typo here again. Um, <laughs> this is so the second the second parameter is actually the namespace. Um, so by default in WordPress, it is, I believe it's just WP. Um, and then V2 is the version. And then posts are the end, is the endpoint. So this is going to say, like, grab some posts. And you can also add a parameter that says search. So I'm just going to search for dance videos. Um, and then what you get back is JSON. Uh, so I know most of you are already familiar with that. So I'm just going to zip right through it. Um, but basically, you have just all the information that WordPress wants to give you about this um, in terms of keys and values um, as JavaScript objects and arrays. Uh, so you'll notice one of the things you'll notice is that out of the box, it doesn't give you, it gives you a lot of stuff, but it doesn't give you a lot of stuff that you need. For example, if you go to author, it'll just give you the number two, which is an author ID. Um, that's not super helpful because you're going to need to do an additional request to um, get that author's information. You know, if you want to know that Greg made this post or Jeff made this post, uh, you don't want to be making requests to the server every three seconds when a video loads. Um, same thing with categories. Uh, so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to go in and modify the endpoint. Um, and it's super easy. Uh, so you'll see all the way down here, I've added one. I wonder if this is scrolling. This is not really scrolling on the page, huh? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> uh, 
there's a speaker mode on the other screen, and I've been scrolling on there. So, just uh, yeah. But down here, I've added uh, this video URL, which just tells you where the video lives, um, and I'll show you guys how to add that yourself. So let's go to the next slide. I know I know about scrolling. Uh, so this is really easy. Uh, you have a function called you know whatever you want. I call this my rest prepare post. Um, it's got three parameters, uh, data, post, or request. Uh, so the data is literally just the data, and there's a nested object in there also called data. Um, you basically want to just add to that array. You want to say, like, we'll call it URL. Um, you'll get the post meta for that ID. Um, get that custom field. If you want to do this with like tags or categories, you can use like get the tags, get the category. Um, and then you just basically set that array back and then you add a filter. Um, and the hook is called rest prepare post. Uh, it works just like any other WordPress filter. And then you get that data in your endpoint. So you can go wild basically with, um, you know, basically flattening out your data structure to kind of minimize the you know, you join everything together and you create like a flatter structure. So you don't have to make a ton of requests. Those requests are like really expensive. And you really want to be presenting your app with the information it needs to do its job with a single request. Um, so if you need a video ID, if you need the video title, you need the video tags, you just want it all in a single JSON object. Um, so the other thing you can do is add custom endpoints. So getting posts is great, getting authors is great, getting tags is great, but you might want to do something a little different. Um, as I mentioned, this video app that I've been making, uh, it just serves up a random video. So we want to create a custom endpoint that just does that, that just gives you a certain number of random videos. <clears throat> so this is a function that will grab random posts. Um, it just takes in some data, and basically it just gets post, post type post, post per page data, um, and then also the number, which is 20 by default, and then order by random, that's it. It's just a normal get post name, uh, and then it returns null. And that's just that. Uh, and now down here, you just add the action, um, and this is, this is where you kind of define your, your own endpoint. Uh, so just like we saw WP and V2 before, I'm calling this endpoint uh, BTV and V1. Uh, and then this is the actual name of the endpoint, random, right here. And we have a little regular expression. And what this is saying is that you're getting a parameter and it's going to be a number. And that's where, um, that's where that number comes in. So you can specify you want 20, you want 40, you want 50, you want one. Um, and then it just specifies get as the method, and you give it a callback. So the callback was the name of our function uh, up above, up here. So it's really simple. Uh, and then after that, this is what you get back. Uh, so you see I just truncated it to one. But you see, this is a random video. It's called Let's Paint a Lion Exercise and Play Chess TV. Are there any Let's Paint and Exercise fans in the crowd? No, I didn't think so. It's great. You should check it out. Uh, so you, got, you get the post name. You get unique ID. Um, and again, this is, this is not super useful. This is information that's useful to WordPress, but not really useful to us. Um, so I didn't go through and you know, do all the transformations yet that need to happen to be able to present the right data. But really, we want something streamlined. We want basically just like the video source, the ID, the title. Uh, you know, here's tags with just name and slug um, in an array. And then you have another video, and it just kind of repeats that way. Um, so like really, like what they're giving us up above is very verbose. Uh, and doesn't actually contain a lot of information, and where we want to get it is is right here. So by writing writing those filters and actions, um, we can basically accomplish that. And that is as much of the WordPress API as I wanted to cover, um, just because I know that there have been numerous talks um, about it, and I know you guys have a lot of experience. 
and I wanted to jump more into React and React Basics. Um, so I know there were also a lot of people who've used React before, right? Uh, but has anyone used Angular or Backbone as well? Just quickly. That's great. I think React is the best. Um, I'm not super into like knocking other frameworks, but um, once you get it, it's really nice to program in. Um, one of the things I really like about it is that it takes advantage of ES6. Uh, so I know a lot of you said that you've used ES6 before. Uh, so doing making requests to an API is very easy using fetch and promises. Uh, it handles asynchronous requests really well. Um, there's also other nice ES6 features like template literal or string literals, um, string interpolation, and you can just stop typing semicolons. That's pretty cool. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is right here, uh, just the ES6 example of how you would make a fetch. Um, so you'd set a request URL here. Um, you'd say fetch it, and then this is a promise. Uh, how many of you guys are familiar with promises? All right, fewer. So basically, instead of uh, making an AJAX request in the older versions of JavaScript, uh, you guys would have a callback, and basically, there's this place called callback hell where you just have this cascading list of callbacks as one thing happens and another thing happens and another thing happens. So promises uh, attempt to kind of resolve that by just saying like, do a thing, that thing will either succeed or fail, and then after that, you do another thing. Um, so it makes it just super, super simple. It's baked into ES6 and <clears throat> basically React is really good at taking that and then deciding through its life cycles, which I'll talk about in a minute, what you want to do after that. Uh, so here, you know, we're basically just using the fetch command. We're saying like, hey, grab this URL. Then we get a response. We're converting it to JSON. Uh, and then we're taking the data, and we're using it to set our React state. Now, uh, setting state in React is really easy. Uh, you just use set state. But also, uh, in React, there are other things that help you kind of reduce and play around with your state and manage your state. Uh, there, there's this design pattern called Flux. Um, some of you guys might have heard of Redux, right? Uh, so Redux is an implementation of Flux. And basically, I'll talk about it in a minute, but it enforces some helpful design patterns that help you program defensively and help you kind of make, make better programming decisions. Um, so on top of that, you have an error state, which you can do error handling if you need to. Um, not all requests will make it, um, and it's important to handle that. Uh, and that's it. That's Instead of having like a nightmarish cascade of callbacks, you just kind of tell your app what its state is, and you kind of go about your merry way. So that's really helpful. Uh, so React has something called life cycles. Uh, so for every component, uh, there's a series of events that happen. Uh, there are probably four different cycles, four or five different cycles that each have four or five different actions. Uh, I've just highlighted two right here. Uh, so there's something called component did mount. There's also component will mount. So it's basically saying like, is this component being instantiated in my app? What do I do when that happens? Um, so for example, when you know the component mounts for a video, you want to call the play video function. Um, the other one that is really helpful is that with all these changes that are happening in your app state, React needs to know when to update those components. And if you tell it when it needs to update those components, it won't go crazy trying to figure out what to do. It'll only update and re-render the components that need to be re-rendered based on your data. Uh, and it'll be more performant. It'll get better frame rate and stuff like that. So there's this really helpful function called should component update. Um, there's also will component update and did component update, et cetera. Um, but basically, it just does a Boolean um, comparison. You basically have access to the, the properties and the state that are about to happen. And I'm just using Lodash here to do, like a, do an object comparison to check that this state is equal to the next state or not equal. And if it's not equal, it's going to return true. It's saying that like this component should update. Um, it's basically the simplest way to do that, but you can, you know, you might only care about one field in your state. You might only care that a button is clicked. You might only care that you've got new data. Um, so I've also linked, there is a great article explaining all the different React life cycles. It's linked to right there. Um, but lifecycle management is one of the like killer features of React, and it's really worth taking the time to understand it um, in depth. 
Uh, so another great thing about React is there is easy templating with JSX and reusable components. Um, so JSX is just basically like a hybrid of JavaScript and HTML. Um, so I have an example here. Um, so basically, these are just two top and bottom of a specific file. Uh, you just import your components up here. And then this is what JSX looks like. You have a render function that just returns. Uh, this is just plain HTML, but with a few small differences. Uh, you have a class uppercase name uh, instead of class, because that's a reserved word in JavaScript. And React has all these like reserved words, and it can seem scary at first. But uh, the console will bark at you if you use the wrong one, or if you use the one that you're used to using, and it's pretty simple to fix. Um, you know, so we just put our JavaScript in here. We have on-click handlers that will manage things just like normal. Uh, and then we can also call components uh, either without parameters, like sidebar here, or with parameters. So this is, this is how we pass parameters down. We have the current video, and we want to render a video. So we just say, hey, video, here's the URL. Do your job. Uh, it makes it really easy to like reuse components, keep components organized. Uh, once you get used to it, it's very, very nice. Uh, it's a little nicer than using PHP includes, in my opinion. <clears throat> um, so I was talking a little bit about Flux before. Um, this is the big thing with React and Flux, is that it encourages unidirectional data flow. Um, what that means is that you start kind of with an inverted pyramid. You start with a lot of data. You have all the data that the API returns. And as you call components, you are only really passing them the information they need to do their job. And each component should only really have one job. Uh, the components define themselves the interface for interacting with their parents. Uh, and they should only, like I said before, they should only receive the information they need. Uh, so if you're passing like an entire video object to a component that only renders the title, you're not really doing it right. Uh, so I will not have time to get into Redux right now, but uh, definitely check it out. It's really good for basically mapping your state to your properties. Uh, properties are component values. Um, and state is just the overall kind of texture of what's going on in the app. Um, so here's kind of just an example of uh, how using prop types, uh, which is a tool, we can just define the interface by which we interact with something. So we just have a video component. Uh, it has a render function. And basically, we're grabbing video URL out of the props. And down here, uh, we're just defining prop types. And we're saying video URL, we're expecting it to be a string. So every time you pass data to a component, you really want to just define that interface so that um, basically if you start going astray and passing incorrect data to your components, uh, it'll basically throw warnings, throw errors, and you code defensively, and you kind of save yourself from bugs uh, in the future. Um, so that's like a very, very like glossy high-level overview of some of the like core concepts in React. Um, it gets a lot deeper from there. <clears throat> um, but I wanted to take a minute and show you kind of what the final product is. And this isn't completely done in React, but this is like the production site I have that is built off of WordPress. Uh, so it's just my stupid video site, and hopefully it'll render. Oh, it's huge. But yeah, it's super ugly, and we'll just play a video whatever that's called. And yeah, you can either just like watch it or not. You can navigate based on tag. And you can just check out this guy doing a cool dance. And you can pause or not. There's like really no navigation. Um, actually, I think the skip button is a little hidden here. I wonder if I could skip using a keyboard shortcut. But I forget what it is. There we go. Yeah, so you can skip. Now it's Crystal Lake National Aerobic Championship. That's cool. So all these are in WordPress just with a custom field. Uh, if you guys haven't seen this before, this is an hour long. I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, it's super good. Um, so all these are just every single video is a single post in WordPress. It has a single custom field called video URL. And this is just consuming 20 or so of those at a time and just like serving them up in a random, random order. Uh, so you can just kind of skip through them or whatever. Um, and it's kind of a fun experience. Uh, so I mean, this is just an example of like, you know, you can do whatever you want using WordPress, React API. You know, there are plenty of 
really good use cases, and there are plenty of like really dumb use cases. Is the sound actually playing? That's incredible. Okay, we're gonna get off this though. <laughs> All right. Um, so the last part of my talk is just linking to some of these uh, tools and frameworks that uh, I mentioned. So the easiest way to create a React app uh, is just using Create React App, which is a tool from Facebook. Uh, just bootstraps you in a, like a super quick environment. Um, you just kind of run the command. You run npm start, and you're good to go. Uh, it's really great for just sketching out a quick app as quickly as possible. I mentioned React Native before. It helps you build mobile apps using JavaScript and React. Uh, React Skeleton is that framework I mentioned before, where it's just basically the smallest WordPress theme I could create that also gives you space to run uh, run a React bootstrap inside of it. Um, Automatic has one. It's highly experimental. They have disclaimers all over it, but it's called Picard. Uh, it's pretty good. And I found another one called WP API React. Um, it's a standalone framework, and it has Flux implementation via something called Alt, which I haven't used before. Uh, there's also a really useful article that kind of shows you, guides you through the first couple steps. Um, there's a lot of really great resources on learning React um, and the WordPress API. These are just a link to a few of them. Uh, most of these come from Facebook or WordPress themselves. Uh, and at the bottom, we have that New York Times talk from Scott Taylor telling you guys about how they um, basically did their breaking news coverage through that. Um, so that is it. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you guys for listening. So if you have any questions, step up to the mic. We have uh, about eight and a half minutes. All right, we got the first one. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, the biggest way to get around that is through uh, caching. Um, so, you can cache requests, for example. I mean, if you're just thinking about your normal WordPress site, if you're getting the most recent 20 posts uh, from your blog, that's always going to be the same, and you can, you can cache that response. Um, something that I've done for my stupid video app, uh, Breed TV, because it's uh, completely random and caching is kind of antithetical to what it is is I grab a lot of videos all at once, and I will um, I'll be a little greedy about when I make that request. So I'll, I'll make that request when they still have two or three videos in the back, and then add those to the queue so that it's not, it's opaque to the user what's going on. They just have a seamless experience. So you can always find ways to be, on top of caching, on top of the technical ways, you can always find ways to be predictive about what your users are going to do. Um, you know, we didn't go over doing, uh, post requests or having user submitted input, but something that's a big part of the um, Facebook tutorials on how to like make basic apps is that you kind of render things optimistically. So if you're posting a comment on a post, uh, something that it'll do is it'll just display the post as if it had posted uh, on, your, on your screen and then make the request in the background and then notify you if there's a problem rather than when there's a success. So that way they just move on to other things, maybe reading other comments, maybe even responding to other comments, and it's a seamless experience for them. So. <clears throat> Got a question coming from the back. Uh, just wanted to let you guys know I wasn't just standing here in silence. <laughs> there was a reason for it. Hey, so our company, uh, my name's Daryl, our company increases uh, like medical websites for doctors. Yep. And what I want to know is we're really running into an issue where they want like video backgrounds and they want to be really like, picture heavy, um, flash websites. But if they can go with this little makes or SEO for them, or would this be able to help us in that situation or is this, would it be a difficult to react and work us together to make it faster? 
I think the answer is yes and no. I think you get a lot from moving to a certain ecosystem. Uh, for example, with elections, uh, just running off of like, Webpack does a lot of optimizations, uh, and there's a lot of things that just improve the general frame rate. Like I mentioned, uh, being able to decide if a component should re-render itself is really helpful. Uh, you could probably be smart in React about how to lazy load those images or those videos uh, in a way that's very sensible. You can lazy load on any site, but having the options to kind of manage state um, you know, within React is beneficial and will help you code in a way that does kind of bring your frame rate and your time to paint up uh, if you're careful. Um, there are a lot of kind of wonky performance hacks like all WordPress, like there are like lazy loading plugins and stuff like that, but they're not always the greatest for production environments. Um, and when it's just pictures and video, I think that's going to be um, a challenge. Um, I think something that has helped uh, that I've read about is that if you have like huge tables or huge graphics, um, what you can do is you can actually remove things that are out of the viewport off of the DOM and cache them in memory. And then as they approach viewability again, you reattach them. And I saw a proof of concept where it was like a very dense table and it, they were basically able to get a very seamless infinite scroll effect on it just by doing that. Um, so that might be a technique that you want to one of you. Because yeah, when you get tons of videos, and even if you're not looking at them, they're just sitting there in the DOM, they're taking up memory. Uh, there are lots of things like when you append things or have effects, like the DOM has to reflow itself, and you really want to manage that carefully. So to follow up just a quick Yeah, I mean, you can certainly use uh, React to load static content. I think where React shines is when there is like richer, a more richer dynamic experience. Um, but one of the things that React benefits from is the whole kind of node ecosystem where I think it is maybe just for me easier to find optimizations and find tools that are very performance mindful in that ecosystem than there are in the PHP ecosystem. Um, Usually with PHP, I've found like the solution is to kind of throw more memory or throw more caching around it. And, um, yeah, that's its own way, but yeah. Well, thank so, you very much. No problem. Uh, so we have about three minutes, uh, so maybe one or two more questions. Yeah, so I started learning React uh, about a year ago. Um, as I mentioned, it was for elections, so we started that, I think, in August for, obviously, a November release. Uh, I was fortunate to work with somebody who knew React a bit better than I did. Um, and I will be honest, it took me a little bit to understand it. Um, and I think that's very common. But I think there's a point when kind of a light bulb goes off. Like, I've also had this problem learning Angular, and I I feel like with Angular and some other frameworks, you just kind of hit a wall and you're smashing your head against the wall. Um, I think there's never a point with React where it feels undoable or unsurmountable. Um, and I feel like the learning curve is much more friendly. And not because they're pulling any punches or it's a simpler framework, but just because it's designed in a way that's very elegant and very easy, easy to understand with effort, I'd say. Yeah, no problem. All right, one more question. <clears throat> what do you think is the uh, best resource uh, in terms of what? Uh, in terms of what? Uh, resources not following that in terms of what? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so if I could go back. Uh, so this intro to React here, uh, this is basically put out by Facebook. Um, they're the people who made the React framework. Um, it is very accessible uh, and very easy to learn. Um, the Create React app GitHub, like README, actually has a lot of information on just how to get started on your own project, how to add SAS to it, how to like deploy it to GitHub pages, uh, stuff that you wouldn't normally see from just a normal React package. Uh, and also, even though Redux is kind of an add-on to, uh, to React, this Redux guide is actually fantastic at um, 
kind of also learning some of the core concepts of React. Um, they go hand in hand very, very well. Uh, so I would definitely start there. Um, they really did a good job of that, of uh, creating that documentation above and beyond what normal documentation would be. Uh, so that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, hope you enjoyed this talk. Yeah.